Chapter 13 Are you sure of this, Counselor? Picard asked, his voice booming across the nearly empty stellar cartography room. Not entirely, sir, Troy admitted. The feelings I got during the meeting were so fleeting that I only have vague impressions. She hated sounding so equivocal, but she knew that evaluating the emotions of others was far from an exact science. Just because you sensed feelings of betrayal coming from Commander Zweller doesn't necessarily mean he's working with the enemy, Counselor, said Badenides, her expression showing slight annoyance. All the same, Marta, we both know that Corey's story hasn't been adding up. Picard splayed his fingers on the dais railing and stared down at them. Was he working with Falhain's rebels or was he just playing along to find a way to free his fellow officers? Did he provide them with weapons? How much does he know about the Romulans' involvement in this sector? What isn't he telling us? I'm afraid I can't be of much help, Captain, Troy said. According to his records, Commander Zweller is a non-telepathic human, but he apparently knows how to erect mental shields. Maybe some people just don't like to have their minds probed without permission, Batonide said testily, crossing her arms. In Starfleet intelligence circles, it's not uncommon to protect oneself against Betazoids, Ullians, Vulcans, or other telepaths. Troy knew that the Admiral had been uncomfortable around her ever since her return, she assumed it was most likely because of what Batonides had learned about her lover and his possible provocative actions at the peace conference. The counselor momentarily considered confronting the senior officer with this observation, but decided against it. Best to let the matter drop. Sir, I still have more work to do helping the Slayton survivors. Is there anything else I can help with? Picard nodded to her, his eyes darting momentarily to Batonides. No. Thank you, Deanna. I'll, will, take your concerns under advisement. With a curt nod, Troy backed away and stepped through the door and into the corridor. She scarcely needed her betazoid abilities to interpret the Admiral's hostile parting glare. The doors to the aft observation lounge parted with a faint pneumatic hiss, and Picard strode in, the Admiral at his side. Picard found Corton Zweller standing in the dimly lit chamber, staring idly at the sparse starfield that lay beyond the Enterprise's stern. Zweller turned desultorily toward him, and the captain stared at his friend for a moment, searching his eyes, looking for some sign that things were not as confused as he feared. But all he saw was a carefully blank countenance, a Vulcan-like mask, that concealed all emotion. The silence, stretched uncomfortably. Picard sighed heavily. We need to talk, Corey. Just you and me and Marta. Again? What about, exactly? I think you know, said Picard. He sat behind the long, low table, and gestured for Zweller to take a seat across the table from him. Batonide sat beside Picard, her hands steepled under her chin as she studied each of her old friends in turn. There are still some troubling, inconsistencies, in your accounts of your time on Kiaros 4, Picard said. Such as? Have you gotten new information from Grelin? Or has my esteemed colleague Dr. Gomp renewed his campaign of character assassination? Batonide spoke up then. Grelin's not talking much. And none of your esteemed colleagues seem to have a very high opinion of you right now. Zweller snorted, but the Admiral pressed on. Everyone seems convinced that you worked closely with Falhain and Grelin both, aiding the army of light rebels in their fight against Roward. I've said as much. I freely admit that I helped them somewhat, Sweller said, leaning back in his chair. The only way I was going to get my fellow crew members off that planet was to pretend to work with them, until such time as I could seize an opening, and escape. What lengths were you willing to go to before your attempted escape, Corey, Batonides asked. Did you provide them with the weaponry that they used in the attacks on the peace conference? Or the other attacks on Ruward's forces? And why did you aid them in kidnapping the Enterprise officers? Whoa, slow down, Marta. One question at a time. They already had some weapons when I was captured, when we were captured. I assume they may have gotten them from the Romulans. 
It didn't seem particularly important where they got them at the time, just that they had them. And I did not participate directly in the melee at the peace conference. Picard was incredulous, and interrupted his friend. Then how did you remove Riker's and Troy's comm badges? Zweller's jaw clenched, almost imperceptibly, and he spoke again, his voice as carefully modulated as before. I said that I did not participate directly in the melee. I was with Grelin's troops in an antechamber, trying to keep them calm while their leaders negotiated. I hoped that all of us from the Sladen would be released if the talks went well. When the fighting began, which, I might add, was not precipitated by any of Falhain's men, I bullied aside two of my guards to rescue Riker and Troy before they could be killed. I still don't know who started the attack, Jean-Luc. But I was trying to save your officers' lives. Batonides's voice was stony. Why did you remove their comm badges? You allowed them to be taken prisoner. It all happened very fast. I grabbed the comm badges because I thought Roward's people were behind the attack. I already told you, they could have used the comm badges as automatic target locks and killed Riker and Troy. You have to admit that the creation of Federation Martyrs would have given Kiaro's Force Pro Federation faction a real boost. Picard wasn't entirely convinced by the argument. But Sweller's easy facility for providing plausible sounding answers impressed him. The captain leaned forward and pitched his voice low. Corey, did you come to believe in Falhain's cause? Do you mean did I think that Ruward's regime was an oppressive, murderous, genocidal government that the Federation shouldn't ally itself with? His eyes narrowed. Yes. Picard sat back in surprise as Zweller stood and began pacing. I saw what they did to the Kairosan villagers, the commander said. So did Riker and Troy, they witnessed what was left of one settlement. They told you about it. There are only so many charred bodies of men, women, and children you can see, slaughtered for no reasons other than resource greed and politics, before you begin to know that something is fundamentally wrong. Zweller turned to look at Picard. The Federation wasn't thorough in their investigation of this world before they began the process of acceptance, Johnny. They were more concerned with beating the Romulans to the punch. But they chose the wrong side this time. And not everyone at Starfleet disagrees with me. He paused for a moment, and looked Batonides squarely in the eyes. Not even everyone in Starfleet intelligence. What? The Admiral stood, an expression of amazement on her face. Zweller appeared unfazed. You haven't asked me about the Romulans yet. Did I know that they were working with Falhain? Picard's mind raced as he tried to formulate a line of questioning for this new revelation. He went with the most obvious choice first, did you know about them? Of course I did. Certain echelons of Starfleet knew about them. You'd have to be dense not to at least suspect it. There's a fine line between suspecting and knowing, Picard said harshly. You keep bringing Starfleet into it as if that justifies your actions, said Batonides. I hate to be so blunt, Corey, but you're only a science officer. I think that Johnny, as a starship captain, or myself, as a vice admiral in intelligence, might have some better first-hand knowledge of Starfleet's intentions. Zweller took a deep breath, closed his eyes, then opened them and spoke in a quick, precise cadence. I was billeted to the Slayton to help facilitate my other assignment. My real assignment. That mission was to find out what was really happening on Kiaros 4, by any means necessary, including infiltrating the rebel factions, and to let the Federation know exactly who they were getting into bed with. Batonides's eyes widened. Your mission for whom? What the hell are you talking about? I'm not at liberty to discuss my orders, or exactly to whom I'm reporting," Sweller said coolly. Let's just say that I've been working on behalf of an unspecified branch of Starfleet intelligence, and leave it at that. So you've lied to us again," Picard added, feeling pained and more than a little angry. Everything you've told us thus far is just another string of. Sweller interrupted. I've told you what you needed to know, Jean-Luc. In fact, I've probably told you too much. 
too much, Picard said, his ire threatening to boil over. Your ship was destroyed. Your people were taken captive, as were some of mine. I've narrowly escaped death twice, and Marta's fiancé was not so fortunate. The Kairosans are voting right now to reject Federation membership, which will leave this entire sector at the mercy of the Romulans, who have just found a way to use this system to make their fleets unstoppable. Picard paused, letting the enormity of his accusation sink in. Glaring, he continued. I think you haven't told us nearly enough, Commander. Zweller turned his back to his friends, and walked over to the viewing window, staring out at the sparse sea of stars floating in the blackness. Finally, he spoke. None of this was supposed to happen. Certainly not the Slayton's destruction or the Ambassador's death. And nobody knew about the subspace singularity. He paused and put one hand to the back of his neck, before speaking again. As for the fate of Kiaros IV, I don't believe that its destiny has ever lain with the Federation. Roward's brutality would have been a black eye on the UFP's peaceful, smiling face. The planet was a write-off before you ever got here. Batonides's tone was wrathful. Are you saying that Aubin died for nothing? No. I'm saying that a deal had already been brokered, to hand Kiaros IV over to the Romulans. At the time, my superiors believed that the only result of Romulan annexation would be the loss of an expanse of space that perfectly defines the term, void. As I said, no one knew about the singularity. Picard became aware that his mouth was hanging open in surprise. He shut it with an audible snap, then spoke again. You said that these supposed higher-ups in Starfleet had made a deal. What were we allegedly getting in exchange for handing this system over to the Romulans? The Romulan Tal Shi'ar was going to furnish a list of all Romulan intelligence operatives working inside the Federation. Prior to the discovery of the subspace singularity, it had looked like a pretty good deal. Zweller picked at a loose thread on his tunic, a mannerism so casual that the revelations he was sharing might have been something as innocuous as souffle recipes. Picard wasn't sure what angered him the most, the secrets, the lies, or Zweller's cavalier attitude. I'm to meet with Tal Shiar Chairman Koval at a remote location in the Kairosan asteroid belt immediately after the Romulans win the referendum, Zweller said. There, he'll give me a data chip containing the list. In other words, you're betraying the Federation to the Romulans for a chip, Batonide said, her voice taut. Zweller's face and voice betrayed only a flicker of emotion as he leaned forward, hands on the table. No, Marta. I'm acting on behalf of an agency whose highest priority is the Federation security. As far as my superiors knew, my mission would have cost us little and benefited us greatly. You know as well as I do that those Romulan agents are probably set to be purged anyhow, she replied. And that there are probably innocents on that list who will be removed from their posts or charged with conspiracy so that the Romulans can replace them with their own people. I don't think that any Starfleet intelligence operatives will be charging forward blindly to arrest and prosecute everyone on the list without first. Enough. Picard slammed both hands down on the table, scowling at his two oldest friends. He had a hard time swallowing everything Zweller had just told him, on the other hand, he certainly couldn't dismiss out of hand the commander's charges against Roward's government. Riker and Troy had corroborated that part of Zweller's story after all. The captain turned toward the admiral and spoke, his tone measured. We must salvage as much of this situation as possible. I think it's clear now that Roward and her government have been concealing their ethnic cleansing pogroms from us all along. And now that the rebel headquarters have been destroyed, Regardless of who is responsible, the people seem certain to reject Federation membership, and perhaps even Roward's continued rule. I'm afraid I must agree that the loss of Kiaros IV seems a foregone conclusion at this point. He switched his gaze from Batonides to Zweller, and continued. You've obfuscated the truth so much, Corey, that I almost don't know what to believe anymore. Except for this, your exchange with the Romulans must go ahead as planned. What? Why? Batonides appeared dumbfounded. Zweller looked surprised as well. Marta, 
If the Romulans are playing straight with Cory, Picard said, then we'll at least get that list of spies. Cory's extra-legal skullduggery and the loss of the Slayton won't have been entirely in vain. Picard observed Cory wince almost imperceptibly at the mention of his destroyed starship, he didn't need Troy's talents to notice Sweller's obvious burden of self-recrimination, deserved or not. Picard looked at Batonides, who seemed to be weighing his words carefully. After a moment, she nodded and said, I think you and I are finally on the same page, Johnny, though I have to confess to some surprise to hear you sanctioning a covert operation. Picard's memory conjured images of his capture on the planet Seltris III, four years ago, during a secret mission to find a Cardassian metagenic weapon. He fleetingly recalled the horrendous torments, both physical and psychological, he had endured at the hands of his inquisitor, Gul Madred. It wouldn't be the first time, Picard said, his throat suddenly dry. Badenides shrugged. Be that as it may, you left out an important detail. What's that? Picard said, his brow wrinkling. I'm going with him, she replied. Now it was Picard's turn to be surprised. Actually, I was thinking that I should be the one to go, Marta. You're not an intelligence officer, Johnny, she said, a sly smile crinkling the corners of her mouth. I am. And I outrank you, so please don't bother arguing. I suppose you are the best choice to render aid to Mr. Zweller, should he need it, Picard said, admitting defeat. And to keep an eye on him in case he has any other tricks up his sleeve. Picard knew that he didn't need to say that out loud, he assumed that both Batonides and Zweller were already thinking it as their reflections regarded each other appraisingly across the polished tabletop. Breaking the silence, Picard said, still, I have to point out that there's some real danger here. Batonides flashed him a, no kidding, look of mock surprise. He ignored it, and continued. While we're trying to neutralize the singularity, we'll stand a greater chance of success if we can divert the Romulans' attention elsewhere. On to the two of us, Batonide said. In other words, Zweller said acerbically, we're going to serve as a distraction. Picard ignored the comment. You'll be issued a shuttle so you can make your rendezvous at the appointed time. The captain's comm badge suddenly chirped, and Will Riker's voice issued from it. Captain, I think we've finally got some good news. Geordi has worked out the details of his plan for dealing with the singularity. And not a moment too soon, Picard thought. Splendid, number one. I'll join you on the bridge in a moment. Rising from his chair, Picard took a last look at his two friends, and fleetingly saw them as they had once been, rousingly ebullient, and slightly rebellious, cadets. How time and politics change us all. It is vitally important that you keep the Romulans occupied, he said, straightening his tunic as he prepared to exit the observation lounge. And personally, for me, it's equally as important that both of you return from your appointment, alive. We'll deal with these other matters, later. If there is a later for the three of us, Picard thought as he strode down the corridor. The silence in the room was palpable after Picard departed. Batonides's thoughts were a whirl, as she tried to make sense of the revelations to which she had just been made privy. She looked over at Zweller, who was now slumped in his chair, refusing to meet her gaze. He spoke first. I'm sorry, Marta. It wasn't my intention to have this all go south. I'd do anything to bring the crew of the Slayton back, and Aubin was. Don't. Her voice was firm and unyielding. Don't you dare bring Aubin into your. And then it hit her. Troy's premonition of danger at the peace conference, when she had pushed Picard to safety. The emotion amplifying chip and its contents, as described by the android. Some of the things Aubin had said and done on this mission. Before now, none of them had connected. Now, though she didn't want to think it, the words came into her head in a flood. Alban was Corey's partner in sabotaging the Kairos and peace talks. Stealing her nerves, she began moving around the conference table towards Zweller. He was working with you, wasn't he? she asked. Zweller looked up at her, a flicker of surprise in his gaze. She was glad to see that for once in the last hour, 
she had been the one to surprise him. She continued, he was part of your group. He didn't come here to promote peace, he came here to help end Ruward's regime and lose the Geminis Gulf to the Romulans. He was doing what was best for the Federation, Marta. He was following his orders. She began to turn, then brought her left hand up in a clenched fist. Her blow connected to Zweller's jaw with a crack, and he went cartwheeling backward, out of his chair. Sprawling, the commander rubbed his jaw. Ow, he said simply. Get up too soon and I'll knock you right back on your ass, Cory. Badenides massaged her fist a bit, and looked down at her friend. How should I react? First I find out that one of my oldest friends has betrayed his ideals and is collaborating with the Romulans. And now I find out that the man I loved, who was slaughtered in the midst of a peace initiative, is just as much a traitor to everything I believe in. I'm not a traitor, Marta, he said emphatically, holding his hands up, palms outward, as if to ward off any further blows. And neither was Aubin. We were following orders from Starfleet, orders that worked to the benefit of the Federation. Oh yes, I can see the big benefit. A starship and her crew destroyed. Countless Kairosans, dead. A famed ambassador, murdered. The fleet's flagship, about to be booted out of the system. Unless, of course, we go to war over a rebel prisoner who has requested asylum. Have I missed any of your benefits? And who exactly was it who cut your cloak and dagger orders, Corey? I'm a flag officer in Starfleet Intelligence. Don't you think I would know about any clandestine deals with the Romulans? You know as well as I do that there are branches of Starfleet that are more, covert than intelligence. Badenide seemed unconvinced. Shadowy government bureaus may be all the rage for your buddies, the Romulans, or some of the other warlike cultures, but they haven't existed on Earth since the 21st century. Zweller sighed, then stood, keeping a discreet distance from the Admiral's striking range. What do you want to hear, Marta? That you're right? That those in power have never seen a need to secretly bend the rules that they uphold in public? That even Starfleet intelligence has never stepped over the line to protect the Federation from its enemies? What is it you want to hear? Squaring her shoulders, Badenides looked her compatriot in the eyes. She had to say the words out loud, though she feared even thinking them. For years she had heard the rumors of a shadowy group of operatives, now, she might have been in bed with them, literally and figuratively. Tell me there is no Section 31. Tell me that you're a rogue agent. Tell me that Aubin was an ambassador who was just trying to settle a civil war on behalf of the Federation's diplomatic corps. In Sweller's eyes, Badenides saw sorrow, and perhaps a bit of pity. She knew then that her friend still loved her, and that his loyalties were conflicted. But she also saw the cold, brutal truth. Section 31 was real, and Aubin Tabor, had done its bidding. He turned away from her, hands clasped behind his back, and stared out at the stars. Badenides massaged her bruised hand, trying to calm herself, breathing as regularly as she could. A smoldering rage was building, inside her. But what could she do about it? Badenides turned her back on Zweller, and started to go. Then she stopped at the door, and spoke to him once more, over her shoulder. I'm going to bring section 31 down, Corey. For my memory of what Aubin was, and for the man, you used to be. And you have to decide, whether or not you're going to stop me. Chapter 14 For a few moments after he returned to the bridge, Picard stood quietly beside one of the aft consoles, as he surveyed his crew in action. Various officers were busily manning stations, scarcely pausing to note his presence. Riker sat confidently in the center seat, as if he was born to it. Picard smiled to himself, taking quiet reassurance from the seamless performance of his crew. It was preferable by far, to shouts of, Captain on the bridge. Report, number one, Picard said as he approached Riker. Geordi and Data are nearly finished loading their attack plan into the Romulan ship's computer core, Riker said as he rose from the chair. 
and Lieutenant Hawk is getting her ready for launch. Picard nodded. Good. How soon can we get the mission underway? No more than another 30 minutes. Maybe sooner. Picard suddenly noticed how drawn and exhausted Troy looked. Who counsels the counselor, he thought. Have the survivors from the Slayton been keeping you busy, counselor? Troy smiled gently. They have required a lot of attention, Captain. But that's to be expected, considering the ordeal they've suffered. Apart from their suspicions about Commander Zweller, their morale is actually quite good. I'm really much more concerned about our other guest. Picard understood immediately. Grelin. Dr. Crusher tells me he's already made a complete recovery. Has he been causing any problems? Not at all, Troy said, sounding surprised. Riker grinned wryly. I suppose it's a lot easier to be polite when no one's shooting at you. I'm certain it's only a temporary ceasefire, Will, Troy said. First Protector Roward isn't about to simply leave him in our custody, political asylum or no. And she'd probably go apoplectic if she saw the VIP stateroom we issued him. Riker shrugged. Big people need big quarters. Do you think Roward would actually be foolish enough to attack the Enterprise, Picard asked Troy. She's certainly angry enough, Captain. But I don't think she'll do anything overt until after the results of the referendum are officially announced. Grand, Picard said, shaking his head. Still, his determination to safeguard Grelin from his would-be executioners had not wavered. So we have to neutralize the singularity and withdraw to a safe position, all within a couple of hundred minutes. At which time the Romulans will be within their rights to use force to get us out of the Geminus Gulf, Riker said. Picard heard a pair of doors swish open behind him. He turned and saw Admiral Badenides enter, to be followed moments later by Zweller. Picard had to fight back his surprise at the sight of the bruise on the commander's jawline. He and Badenides both wore somber expressions, Zweller looked for all the world like a cadet who had just been put on report for brawling. Picard turned back toward Riker. You have the con, number one. I'll be commanding the Singularity mission myself." Riker frowned. Picard didn't need Troy to read his first officer's intentions. No arguments this time, Will. Mr. Data and Mr. Hawk will be with me. This operation can be executed best by a small crew, and it's far too important for me to delegate. With all due respect, Riker said, a crew of two seems a bit too small. Suddenly, the ship lurched hard to starboard, forcing everyone to grab at chairs, railings, and consoles to avoid being flung violently about the bridge. An alarm klaxon shrilled as Zweller toppled hard against a console and Badenides fell onto her knees. The vibrations forced Troy out of her chair, unceremoniously depositing her onto her backside. Riker stumbled, then clutched at a console and struggled back to his feet. Picard stood beside the command chair, grabbing its arms to steady himself. He experienced a fleeting instant of vertigo. Shaking his head to clear it, he wondered if Roward had chosen this moment to launch a surprise attack. Then, almost as quickly as they had come, the vibration ceased. A quick glance around the bridge revealed that no one was seriously hurt. Number one, what just happened to us? Holding tightly to his console, Riker said, it was another subspace distortion wave, Captain. Quite a bit stronger than the previous ones. What the hell are the Romulans up to, Picard said, not expecting an answer. Yellow alert. Status report, Lieutenant Daniels. Staring at his readouts on the upper bridge, Daniels spoke breathlessly. I'm getting reports of minor hull breaches on decks 11 and 12, Captain. Force fields are up, and damage control crews are responding. It could have been a lot worse. What about the Kairosans, Picard said. Can you tell if the planet was affected? Apparently not, sir, Daniel said. I'm monitoring their orbital communications tether now. It seems to be working, and I'm not picking up any emergency message traffic. 
The atmosphere and the planet's night side must have taken the brunt of the shock. I recommend we don't take the Enterprise any closer to the singularity than it already is, Riker said. We can't predict when these subspace slippages will occur, and a ship this large is a sitting duck for spatial disruptions this intense. Won't our shields protect us, Troy said. Riker shook his head. Subspace distortions alter the shape of space itself. The Enterprise occupies a pretty fair amount of that space. And she can't take this sort of punishment the way the planet can. Batonide strode toward the turbo lift, where Zweller awaited her with a sullen expression. She paused in the open doorway and turned to face the bridge. To Picard, she said, Commander Zweller I and will be in the shuttle bay. Picard nodded to her. Everything is ready for you, Picard said simply, then watched as his two oldest friends entered the turbo lift, headed to their rendezvous with Chairman Koval. Just before the doors hissed shut, Picard saw the Thunderheads looming, behind Batonides' gaze. He was supremely thankful, that he was not Corden's Weller. Thanks to the tireless efforts of Data and LaForge, the Romulan scout ship was ready for launch, ten minutes ahead of schedule. The bridge crew had detected three more strong subspace distortion wavefronts, that followed no perceptible pattern. The Romulans were clearly stepping up their efforts. It could be that they were closer to harnessing the subspace singularity's colossal power, than anyone had suspected. But they might also be losing control of it, Picard thought. No wonder they wanted us to clear out of here yesterday. The shuttlecraft Herschel, carrying Zweller and Batonides, had already departed when Picard entered the shuttle bay. Now that the damage had already been done to Federation Kairosan relations, Picard could only hope that his old comrades at arms could extract some useful information from the Romulans. And that they would survive the attempt. Aboard the Romulan ship, Picard found Data seated directly behind the cockpit, where he had become part of an arcane and faintly disturbing tableau. The back of the android's head, including much of his hair, lay discarded on a nearby seat. The gleaming cordonide and duranium of his skull lay exposed, bearing the busy polychromatic flashings of the positronic matrix that comprised his sentience. A flat, paper-thin cable ran from near the top of his head to an information access port in one of the bulkheads. Picard realized he was staring when Data smiled up at him. Please forgive my appearance, Captain. This direct interface will allow me to access the array's security grid a great deal faster than I could by entering commands through the consoles. Picard had rarely seen Data in such a state of partial disassembly. The sight was a stark reminder of the huge gulf that still separated his inorganic friend from the humanity to which he aspired. Organic beings, Picard reflected, tended to take their basic bodily integrity as a fait accompli. Carry on, Mr. Data, Picard said as he made his way forward into the cockpit, where he took one of the two narrow seats. Lieutenant Hawk sat in the other, and was running a series of pre-flight checks. During the flight from the rebel base, Picard had become quite familiar with the scout ship's many systems and instruments, despite the alien appearance of the icons in the cockpit's graphical interface. Still, he was glad to have Hawk at his side on this mission, the lieutenant was not only a fine pilot, but also an exceedingly quick study. Picard was well aware that Hawk had been watching the cockpit controls attentively during much of the voyage from Grelin's compound to the Enterprise. Assuming that we get out of the current circumstances alive, Picard thought, I expect you to go quite far, Mr. Hawk. Captain, could I ask you a question? Hawk said, setting his activities aside for a moment. Picard could see that something was bothering the younger man. Certainly, Lieutenant. What's on your mind? Assuming we succeed, what are the chances of anyone ever locating this subspace singularity again? Commander LaForge is of the opinion that it won't be detectable again for centuries. If ever. I. Hawk hesitated, then seemed to find the courage to go on. Commander Zweller spoke with me shortly after the mission briefing. Picard thought he knew where this was heading. And he believes that we may be overreacting to the threat posed by the singularity. 
I think he may have a valid point, Hawk said. May I speak freely, sir? Of course. We're about to destroy this thing, for all intents and purposes. Doesn't that fly in the face of our overall mission of exploration? It might even be questionable under interstellar law. With the fate of the universe at stake, Lieutenant, I'd gladly face the consequences of my decision in a court of law, Picard said. A moment later, he added, I take it Commander Zweller brought these matters to your attention as well. Yes sir. He did. And are you strongly in agreement with him? Hawk looked uncomfortable. I just thought, I think that the question needed to be raised. Once we do this, there's no turning back. You're right. There is no turning back. Picard sighed and looked through the scout ship's forward viewports through steepled fingers. Lieutenant, I'm not insensitive to your concerns. I've wrestled with the same issues myself. This mission goes against all of my instincts as an explorer. If I thought there were any safe way to preserve this phenomenon for scientific study, I would. But I can't. The risk is simply too great. Still, Hawk said glumly. If we could find some way to save this thing, and harness its power for some peaceful purpose. He trailed off into silence. Lieutenant, are you acquainted with the writings of Lord Acton? Power tends to corrupt, Hawk quoted, nodding. An absolute power, corrupts absolutely. A smile slowly fanned across the younger man's lips. Strange, Picard said. That old caveat always struck me as more chilling than humorous. Hawk looked mildly embarrassed, and his smile abruptly vanished. That isn't it, sir. It's just that. He trailed off again. Picard frowned. Yes. It's just that Commander Zweller told me that you'd probably quote Lord Acton to me if I spoke to you about this. Picard's calm badge overrode his tart response before he could deliver it. Crusher to Captain Picard. Go ahead, Doctor. I just heard that you're planning to fly the mission yourself, the doctor said, her tone slightly chiding. I'm not sure it's a good idea for you to enter the cloaking field. We don't know what effect it will have on your artificial heart. Doctor, what does the cloaking field have to do with my heart? Cloaking devices tend to give off tetrion particles, Crusher said. And that energy field is made up of literally thousands of cloaking devices. Then why wasn't I harmed by the Tetrion emissions that led us to this scout ship? The Tetrion counts inside the cloaking field could be much higher, she countered. You could be flying into a veritable soup of Tetrions. The only thing Picard disliked more than medical conversations like this one, was having them in front of other members of his crew. Damn it, Beverly, I'm not an invalid. Captain, do I have to remind you what happened at the Lenarian conference, Crusher said, beginning to sound impatient. He remembered, all too well. The Lenarians had shut his heart down with a compressed Tetrion beam. That incident had nearly cost him his life. But Picard knew that the stray Tetrion output from any number of cloaking devices was a far cry from a weapon of that sort. Doctor, if you believe that I'm endangering my life unnecessarily, then I suggest you relieve me of duty. I wish I could. No one really knows for certain what the conditions will be like inside the cloaking field. But you need to know the risks. Picard had never enjoyed being reminded that he owed his life to an artificial heart, and that was especially true now that Batonides and Zweller had come back into his life. After all, the only reason he now needed the synthetic organ was because the three of them had once lacked the simple common sense to demur from a fight against three bloodthirsty Nausicans. Picard spoke into his calm badge, his manner somewhat gentler. Objection noted. And if it's any consolation, doctor, we won't need to stay behind the barrier for more than a few minutes at the most. Picard out. Hawk quietly cleared his throat. Everything's green to go, Captain. Then, I trust that means you've put your misgivings aside? Truthfully, Hawk said. Not entirely. It still strikes me as a horrible waste. But we don't have a better option. Picard appreciated Hawk's candor. 
Then let's get underway, he said as he took control of the helm. Cloaking system still functioning properly, Hawk said, looking up from one of his indicator panels. No one would be able to observe the scout ship's departure from the Enterprise. Picard brought the scout ship smoothly forward, guided her through the wide launch bay, and departed for the inky blackness beyond. The viewer now showed the livid red and ochre daylight side of Kiaros 4. Seeing that their heading was already laid in, Picard instructed Hawk to engage the impulse engines at warp point 2. Crossing the approximately 5 AUs that separated Kiaros 4 from the subspace Singularity's cloaking field, would be slow going at that speed, the journey would take about 3 hours, but pushing the scout ship's engines any harder would risk drawing unwanted Romulan attention. Even at this velocity, they would still reach the cloaking field a few minutes before the Enterprise's departure deadline. And a few minutes ought to be all the time data would require. Hawk acknowledged Picard's order, and adjusted the forward velocity to 20% that of light. Kiaros 4 quickly turned away into the darkness and fell away into the infinite night of the Geminus Gulf. The commandeered vessel dove outward beneath the ecliptic, arcing headlong, toward the singularity. Your captain's beverage is delightful, Grelin said to Riker and Troy. The human, Earl Grey, who devised it, must surely be a god among men. Sipping from a mug that looked absurdly tiny in his enormous hand, the Kairosan sat shirtless at the edge of a bed, that seemed scarcely capable of supporting his weight. Now that Will Riker was in close quarters with Grelin, he noticed that the rebel leader smelled faintly of freshly turned earth and lilacs. The aroma, as well as Grelin's fierce mien, reminded him absurdly of Worf. But what struck Riker most was Grelin's astonishing recuperative powers. Less than three days after he had regained consciousness, and had refused further dermal regeneration treatments, Grelin's body bore not a trace of the severe disruptor burns he had sustained during the battle in the rebel compound. Even the coarse brown hair on his thick thewed arms had grown back almost completely. Riker was just as impressed by the huge Kairosan's quiet dignity, as well as by the extreme delicacy with which he held his drinking vessel. Surely, he could have smashed it with a mere twitch of his fingers. I must thank you again for the hospitality that you and your captain have shown me, Grelin continued, setting the mug down on a bedside table. These are splendid quarters, though I must confess that the floor serves me better as a sleeping place than does this child's cot. The Kairosan bared his razor-sharp metallic teeth as he finished this last utterance. Though Riker was reasonably certain the mannerism was the equivalent of a human smile, he was still glad that he had posted a pair of security guards, both armed with compression phaser rifles, just outside the cabin door. We wanted to make you as comfortable as possible, said Counselor Troy, who stood beside Riker. She appeared confident that the Kairosan posed no danger. Still, Riker was uncomfortably aware that Grelin could easily snap her neck without even having to rise to his feet. Grelin tipped his head in apparent perplexity. Riker wondered for a moment if the universal translator had malfunctioned. Or perhaps the Kairosan tongue simply contained no word that corresponded to comfort. No matter, Grelin said. We have much larger problems, you and I. Your captain even now risks his life, to expose the treachery of my predecessor's outworld, allies. He practically spat this last word. Riker tensed at Grelin's mention of Picard's secret incursion behind the Romulan cloaking field. Grelin was somehow aware of the mission, despite his not having been briefed about it. Sweller, Riker thought sourly. We should have arrested him as soon as he came aboard. Even now, he's trying to play both ends against the middle. You disagreed with Falhain's decision to accept aid from the Romulans, Troy said to Grelin, her tone matter-of-fact. It was clear that she wasn't asking a question. Grelin raised and lowered his shoulders in an elaborate triple-jointed shrug. I did not want an alliance with any outworlders. But during Falhain's rule of the Army of Light, my opinion was neither day nor night, and was not sought. While my leader lived, it was my part to go where he led and do as he bid. Grelin paused to raise his cup for another drink before continuing. 
Falhain's untimely slaying changed this. Riker hadn't seen exactly how Falhain had died during the skirmish in the Kairosan capital, he'd already been knocked unconscious by the time the deed had been done. Not for the first time, it occurred to him that maybe Grelin had witnessed Falhain's death, or perhaps even arranged it. Could he somehow be concealing from Deanna his own complicity in the rebel chief's demise? Whatever you might think of us, Riker said carefully, your people will be on their own against the Romulans if the referendum forces the Federation to withdraw from your world. That is now spilled grain, Grelin said. My people will fight any who seek to conquer us. You won't be able to direct a revolution from a Federation starbase, Riker pointed out. That's where we'll have to take you next, if you're really serious about petitioning the Federation for political asylum. Grelin straightened his back, looking both resigned and defiant. Should you not worry instead about your more immediate problem? Roward will send her forces against this ship if you do not surrender me to her before you leave this system. She is implacable. She will not allow me to escape without a fight. A look of deep understanding crossed Troy's face. You want us to return you to your people. You want to continue leading the resistance against Ruward's government. Of course I do, Grelin said, his eyes narrowing with menace, his voice an angry growl. The fur on his neck rose, like that of an agitated cat. Do you think me a coward? Of course not, Troy said calmly, standing her ground, it was unwise to show fear to a Kairosan warrior. I think of you as a leader in exile. At that, the tension in Grelin's muscles relaxed visibly. Leaning forward, he said, you could end my exile. You could return me to the hinterlands to which my people have withdrawn. From there, I could continue the fight. Are you telling us that your asylum request was just a tactic? Riker said, his eyebrows ascending involuntarily. Grelin folded his massive arms across his chest. He who fights and retreats in the now may fight and win in the fullness of time. Riker did not enjoy being manipulated. But he knew that Grelin and his people had few alternatives to subterfuge. Having seen the carnage Roward's regime had inflicted upon the rebel tribes, Riker couldn't say he wouldn't make some of the same choices Grelin had. But there were still rules that had to be observed. Are you withdrawing your asylum request, Grelin? Riker said. Grelin studied him, as though over a hand of five-card stud. What would be the consequence of such an action? We would be legally bound to turn you over to the Kairosan authorities, Troy said sadly. Riker saw tears forming in her dark eyes. She too, had seen the carnage. Riker expected to see rage welling up in Grelin's visage. Instead, there was only sorrow there. Even after I have shown you the villages of the slain, even after your own instruments have recorded the ghosts of the slaughtered children. Your people deprived us of the tricorder evidence we gathered in the village, Riker said. Until both sides stop shooting long enough to let us gather new evidence, we have no objective way to back up your allegations against Roward. And no legal way to get around her extradition request. The last thing Riker wanted was to condemn someone, anyone, to certain death. He hated the situation, and was frustrated with himself for his failure to find an honorable way out. But he knew that Deanna's analysis was correct, they had to either grant asylum to Grelin or else extradite him. It was a clear and apparently irresolvable conflict, between law, and morality. Still, Riker clung to the hope of finding an acceptable third alternative. Data keeps saying that I rely on traditional problem-solving methods less than a quarter of the time, Riker thought. Maybe now's the time for yet another unorthodox solution. Let's speak off the record, Grelin, he said aloud. Starfleet officers are bound by laws that respect the sovereignty of democratically elected governments. Whether you intend to leave your world behind or not, if you withdraw your asylum claim we'll have to hand you over to Roward immediately. You'd be giving us no other choice. Grelin sat in silence as he considered his scant alternatives. Then I shall not withdraw my request, he said finally. But I will find the means to return to the Army of Light, and to lead my people to freedom. Troy turned toward Riker,
concern etched on her brow. Can we still consider his asylum request, Will? He's just admitted that it was only a ruse. Maybe according to your empathic sense, Riker said. But I'm not sure that's admissible in a Federation court. Besides, weren't we speaking off the record? Troy smiled, evidently satisfied with that. Tell me, Commander Riker, what will you do when Roward attacks, Grelin said earnestly. And she will attack, rest assured, probably within the hour. When that happens, will you raise arms against this sovereign government your laws respect so well? Riker wasn't sure what to say to that. After an awkward pause, he said, I'm sure the captain will negotiate a resolution everyone can live with. If he survives his present undertaking, Grelin said earnestly. Jean-Luc Picard is an extremely resourceful man, Riker said. And he has a pair of excellent officers at his side. Then I will pray that will be enough, Grelin said. The voice of Lieutenant Daniels issued from Riker's comm badge. Bridge to Commander Riker. Go ahead, Lieutenant. You wanted to be alerted when the captain's scout ship reached the edge of the Romulan cloaking field, sir. That's due to happen in a little under ten minutes. I'm on my way, Riker said, then excused himself. Data sat motionless behind the scout ship's cockpit, his golden eyes unfocused. Interfaced directly with the ship's systems, the android consulted the sensors and confirmed that the cloaking field lay dead ahead. It was almost time to begin the mission's most critical phase. He heard the captain speaking, his voice sounding as though it had traversed a great distance before reaching him. Any sign we've been detected, Mr. Hawk? Negative, Captain. Our cloaking frequency still matches the data we got from the telemetry probes. The maximum harmonic variances aren't even worth mentioning. Picard sounded relieved to hear that. Good. Mr. Data, it appears there's nothing standing in our craft's way. Let's hope that means there's nothing standing in your way either. Data paused to damp down the output from his emotion chip. Nervousness was an emotion he did not particularly enjoy. Contact with the cloaking field in 15 seconds, Hawk said. Data listened as the lieutenant began counting down. He recognized the slight quaver of apprehension in the lieutenant's voice, and understood its source well enough. After all, if the Romulans had indeed somehow managed to rotate their cloaking field harmonics at any time since the Enterprise had last probed the area, then the scout ship would immediately become conspicuous. A warbird could be upon them in moments, ending the mission ignominiously, and there would be no time for a second attempt. Data's android perceptions were now attuned to an extremely minute resolution, which enabled him to notice the trillions of separate information cycles that occurred every second within his positronic brain. Each of those seconds seemed to last for hours, enabling Data to review most of the onboard library of Romulan literature, music, and drama in an eye blink. Using an infinitesimal fraction of his positronic resources, Data listened as Hawk continued with his countdown, leaving protracted lacunae between each word. 4. Data reiterated the mission plan 2071 times, while simultaneously reviewing the probability theory equations of Earth's Blaise Pascal, as well as the collected sonnets of Phineas Tarbold, of the Canopus planet. 3. Data monitored and corrected an almost undetectable engine output imbalance, which he attributed to the close proximity of the subspace singularity, and at the same time, revisited Kurt Godel's axiom, negating the recursive validation of mathematical systems. 2. He reviewed the mission plan several dozen times yet again while composing a complex contrapuntal string interlude based on large prime numbers and the mathematical constructs of Leonardo Fibonacci and Jean-Baptiste Fourier. At the same moment, he extracted from the ship's computer core the rules to a multidimensional Romulan strategy game that was strongly reminiscent of the meditative Vulcan pastime, known as Calto. Stop fidgeting, Data told himself. 1. Just as the ship crossed the threshold, Data transmitted a simple handshake code to one of the buoys located on the Romulan array's periphery, then patiently awaited a response. After an eternity, 
which concluded in an almost negligible fraction of a second, the counter signal arrived. The buoy appeared to have accepted his credentials, recognizing him as a part of its own programming. His foot, as Geordi might have said, was in the door. Data briefly permitted some real-time visual inputs to enter his accelerated consciousness. He watched as the Romulan array winked into existence on the forward viewer, along with the nearest few dozen of the outermost layer of buoys. From the array's still distant center, the subspace singularity's accretion disk stared out like a baleful red eye. Though he was tempted to pause and continue admiring the vista before him, Data instead shut down his optical inputs and shunted those resources back toward his mission objectives. He resumed parsing time infinitesimally. I can see some of the nearer cloaking buoys, Picard said. There must be thousands of them out there. It's extraordinary. Data felt a stab of envy, since the sensory information he was receiving at the moment couldn't really be described as sight. For about a femtosecond, he longed to see everything the two humans in the cockpit were seeing. He wondered if the abstract polygonal shapes and solid geometrical forms now impinging on his consciousness, resembled the universe as Geordi Laforge perceived it. He put the matter aside for later consideration. Redoubling his concentration on the task at hand, Data extended a significant portion of his positronic matrix through the scout ship's communication system, across a frigid gulf of space, and back into the spaceborne cloaking buoy with which he was linked. He entered the labyrinth of hyperfast subspace channels and positronic pathways that connected the buoy to thousands of identical others. Dozens of blocks of angular Romulan text, each of them scrolling past at lightning speed, flickered almost tangibly before him, though he knew that their ideographic code was visible to no one else. He read them, digested them, analyzed them, and memorized them, as though each byte were taking weeks to move through his quickened sensorium. Slowly, he channeled still more of his positronic resources through his subspace connection with the Romulan security network, bringing his artificial metabolism to a near standstill. Initiate Phase 1, Mr. Data Picard's voice was glacially slow, his words like millennia-old potsherds, that required long and painstaking reassembly. Acknowledged, Data said, opening his aperture into the Romulan network ever wider. Now, forced to use a great deal more of his cognitive resources than before, Data put aside still more of his background activities, concentrating on the swiftly churning labyrinth of visual icons that crowded his subjective sight. Still, it wasn't a severe challenge, all he had to do was repeat particular Romulan algorithms and follow specific electronic pathways he and Geordi had discovered during their lengthy analysis of the scout vessel's computer core. Still, the work took more and more of his attention, and Data felt an increasing sensation of something akin to kinesthesia. It was as though the torrent of information in which he now swam had palpable form, becoming an extension of his artificial body. Disguising several of his own subroutines as maintenance programs, Data slipped into an information channel normally reserved for Romulan engineers and repair technicians. An agonizingly slow search, which lasted just short of half a second of objective time, deposited him inside yet another subsystem, this one designed to allow Romulan technical personnel to adjust the entire facility's cloaking field harmonics. He immediately began making subtle alterations to the programming code contained on several of the array's most critical isolinear chips. At the same time, he altered the scout ship's cloaking frequency so that it would continue to blend in with that of the array. Data's emotion chip surged with elation. If the ploy worked, then the defense systems would soon perceive the array's own structures as external invaders. Those circuits would almost instantly become overloaded with faulty information, freeing data to use the principal maintenance channel to send the containment system an abort order, thus launching the Romulan's entire suite of failsafe programs, and thereby irretrievably banishing the singularity into subspace. With phase one of the mission completed, data swam out of the information stream, forcing his cybernetic awareness to resume assimilating time scales meaningful to Captain Picard and Lieutenant Hawk. Have you noticed any Romulan security programs yet, Mr. Data? Picard asked. Data smiled triumphantly. No sir. And my alterations to the defense system are spreading throughout the network. 
It should be completely paralyzed in another 4.3 seconds. Excellent, Mr. Data. Begin phase two. At once, Data resubmerged himself in the information stream, marshalling his consciousness into the maintenance channels. From this viewpoint, the flow of bytes through the adjacent security network had become a raging torrent, a storm-swollen river of multiplying, self-contradictory information that would surely overwhelm any conscious entity caught on its virtual shoals. Fortunately, the maintenance channels were relatively tranquil by comparison. With a cybernetic whisper, Data loosed the abort command into the maintenance channel's information queue. He watched in contemplative silence as his handiwork propagated itself, copied and relayed through the entire network by dozens of buoys, then by hundreds. The abort protocol began working its way toward the Singularity's containment facility, moving at first in a leisurely inward spiral, then taking on increasing urgency. So far, Data thought, so good. Then, one of the buoys said, no. Immediately, two others rejected the abort order as well. An almost defiant refusal swiftly began escalating throughout the network. The inward spiral slowed, then stopped. Then, reversed. You do not belong here, declared an unseen presence from behind, above, below, between, within, without him. Uh-oh, Data said. The warbird Fry Kala lowered her cloak and approached a battered, lifeless asteroid orbiting at the fringes of the system. This far out, all the violence of the Kairosan sun fit neatly into a deceptively placid pinprick of light. Koval stood in the vessel's control center, observing the Federation shuttlecraft that was keeping station nearby. According to the sensors within the Lumpen planetoid, the shuttle had come out of warp at the system's edge nearly three hours earlier. Koval had no doubt that Commander Corton Zweller was aboard the little craft, and that the Section 31 agent hoped to hold him to his part of their original bargain. Koval had no objection to doing just that. After all, a list of soon-to-be-purged Tal Shiar operatives wasn't worth the smallest fraction of the Geminus Gulf's true value. And with the formal announcement of the Empire's acquisition of the entire region now only minutes away, Koval was more than happy to conclude his deal with his Federation counterpart, magnanimity after such a decisive victory cost very little. Over his Centurion's objections, Koval had himself and a pair of low-ranking Romulan soldiers beamed into the small habitat module built deep into the asteroid's nickel iron interior. Moments later, Koval was standing in the cool confines of one of the Tal Shiar's small but richly appointed safe houses, his guard standing quietly alert behind him. At the opposite end of the chamber, Commander Zweller and a silver-haired woman in a Starfleet uniform shimmered into existence. Koval and Zweller briefly exchanged pleasantries, and Zweller introduced the woman as Marta, his assistant. Silently noting the lieutenant's pips on the woman's collar, Koval nodded courteously to her. It took Koval a moment to place her face, but he quickly recognized her as an important admiral attached to Starfleet's principal intelligence gathering bureau. Batonide, he thought. Or is it Batonides? Regardless, she was one of several Starfleet intelligence operatives whose dossier was familiar to him. Koval surmised that she might not appreciate the extent of her notoriety, and that she had removed her true rank insignia in the hope of obscuring her identity and avoiding capture. He turned his attention back to Zweller, and noticed a slight discoloration along the side of the human's face. Your escape from the rebels appears to have been rather more perilous than I thought, Commander, Koval said. One would think your Federation doctors would have repaired your injuries days ago. Zweller put a hand to the remnants of the bruise on his cheek, then smiled. Oh, you mean this. It happened on the way out to the asteroid. It's an amusing story, really. He paused for a moment to look significantly at his assistant. I fell down. Marta, make a note to have that shuttle's artificial gravity generator checked, as soon as we get back to the Enterprise. Yes sir, the woman said, her tone almost surly. Humans, Koval thought. They say we are difficult to understand. 
The Romulan walked to a table in the center of the room and lifted a clear decanter in which a pale, aquamarine-colored liquid sloshed. He poured a small amount into three glasses, then raised one to his lips. To the future of the Geminis Gulf and the Chiaro system, Koval said before emptying his glass. He relished the burning sensation the pungent liqueur created as it went down. Zweller picked up the other two glasses and handed one to the woman. I can drink to that, he said, and down the beverage without a moment's hesitation. Though the woman seemed a bit put off by the drink's piquant bouquet, she drank her portion as well, though not as quickly. It's been a good while since I've had non-replicated Califal, Zweller said. Though he was smiling, his eyes were hard. Regarding Zweller coolly, Koval segued straight into business. You must be aware by now that the Federation's presence on Kiaros 4 is at an end, Commander. Most of the precincts have already reported their election results. Within perhaps ten of your minutes, First Protector Roward will formally announce her people's willing entry into the Empire. I suppose so, Sweller said, nodding slowly. Then perhaps we should finish our transaction as quickly as possible, the woman said evenly. Koval held up his left hand, palm up, and one of the guards stepped forward and placed a slender data chip into it. Koval was about to present it to Zweller, when the secure calm chip implanted into his jaw, vibrated gently. Because the tiny speaker conducted sound through the bones of his skull, only he could hear Subcenturian Vari's urgent hail. Go ahead, Fry Kala, Koval subvocalized. Only the slight clenching and unclenching of his jaw muscles betrayed the fact that he was having a covert conversation. There's been an attempt to sabotage the Corps, Chairman Koval, Vari said emotionlessly. However, the security failsafe programs are already isolating and purging the intrusion. Acknowledged, Vari. Keep me informed. Koval studied Zweller and Batonides through narrowed eyes. He was well aware of Ambassador Tialik's failure to persuade Picard to make an early departure from the Geminis Gulf. He could only assume that this incursion on the core was Captain Picard's doing. The scout ship that Tialik had said Picard claimed to know nothing about, despite the fact that he'd used it to escape from the Army of Light compound, could have given the Starfleet captain some of the tools necessary to mount an effective assault on the core. But he knew it couldn't give him the capacity to defeat the Rokel, the state-of-the-art artificial intelligence that patrolled the core's every system. Nothing Koval had ever encountered could do that. Chairman Koval, Zweller said, ending the protracted silence. Are you all right? Koval still held the data chip tightly in his hand, and continued searching the humans' faces with his eyes. Their expressions betrayed nothing. Was Zweller involved in the sabotage as well? Or had Picard undertaken the attack entirely on his own initiative? Deciding that the Rokel would render those questions moot soon enough, Koval surrendered the data chip to Zweller, who responded by flashing a toothy smile. When you return to the Enterprise, Koval said quietly, tell Captain Picard that he plays a very dangerous game. That is, if he survives his current endeavor. Koval was pleased to see that Zweller's smile had faltered, ever so slightly. So, he does know something. Koval suppressed a triumphant grin. Koval set his Califal glass down on the table, none too gently. The Federation's welcome in the Geminis Gulf, is now worn out, he said, freighting his words with menace. And when Protector Roward makes the official declaration, you, and every other human in this system, would do well to be heading back toward Federation space, very quickly. End of Part 7 This book will be released in segments each week on our YouTube channel, free of charge. However, to help support the costs involved in creating this audiobook, the entire book is available now to our Patreon supporters. If you would like to listen to the entire book early, please visit patreon.com slash yjk audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and may you live long and prosper.